Amen. Those are words to listen to this morning. Why don't you guys stand with us as we open up? God, would you soften our hearts as we come into your presence? It's already here. We don't have to ask it in. It's here. Amen. Let's read these words together. Our morning opening prayer together. Gentle yet powerful, lowly yet almighty, shepherd yet king. In your greatness, oh, guide us. In your power, strengthen us. In your lowliness, strip from us our selfish pride, which only destroys us. In your greatness, lift us up that we might aspire to greater things. As a shepherd, call us to be your servants. As a king, call us to be your royal priesthood. O oh God, who is our shepherd and our king, O oh Christ, who was crucified and is now risen from the dead, O oh Spirit, who comforts and empowers, O oh Great One in Three, Holy Trinity, this hour, set us free to worship. Amen.
and we are in awe that you would send your son to rescue us. How marvelous indeed is our Savior's love for us. Father, you know every situation in this room this morning, those of us who have come in joyful, those of us who have come in with heavy hearts, <clears throat> and those of us who are maybe just coasting in neutral. And we ask that you meet each and every one of us here at a heart level this morning, meet us exactly where we're at. We love you, Father, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our FPC Vine service this morning. Maybe you're here all the time, maybe just once in a while, or if this is your first time of visiting, please take a moment and fill out your information slip in your worship guide. We also want to take a moment and say warm welcomes to those who are streaming with us online. Thankfully to the technology we have now, if you for whatever reason can't make it, you're out of town, you're ill, you can definitely join us each week online. So <clears throat> in, our Welsh, in our welcome guide this morning, we have several announcements. I'm not going to go through all of those, so whenever you make time, please go through that. There is one thing I do want to mention, though, and that is that our Wednesday classes are starting back up. So please get plugged in. It's a great way to meet new people and also kind of rekindle that sense of community as we go into the new year. At this time, we're going to dismiss the kids in K through third to meet with Miss Joe at the back of the room, and we invite everyone to stand up and greet each other. We come back. Really want this song to uh, kind of be our prayer this morning as we bring our hearts to God, as we bring all our stuff in. I pray that we don't leave our stuff outside. That. Uh, the good, the bad, all the ugly stuff that we bring it in with us. And it's welcome here.
As we prepare for the offering, oh, everyone can be seated. <laughs> As we prepare for the offering, I just wanted to say, uh, Brian took about 22 college-age kids to Passion on January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd to Atlanta, Georgia. And when he came back, he had lots of things to say, but one of the things that stood out was a comment that someone made. It's, it was that every time a group of believers gather, another group of people should feel the effects somewhere else. So every time we as believers gather here, some other group of people should feel the effects of our gathering in some tangible way. So as we prepare for offering right now, let's just pray over the offering. Father, help us to have an impact on our community every time we gather. Give us hearts of generosity to freely give back to you all that you have blessed us with. Bless this offering, and we pray that others in the com community feel its effects and help us to worship wholeheartedly, even with our finances. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, 12 through 16, and 20 through 23. And if you're using the Bibles that are on the chairs around you, it's page 210. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people to bring up from the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out. And Uzzah and Ahio were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today and covering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes, but by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, before we uh, get into the, the message today, I want to make just one quick note. Um, one of our the ch children of our church, who's not, not a child anymore, she's a young woman named Rebecca, Rebecca Castor, who is the daughter of Stan, who plays keys for us on occasion. She's getting ready in about a month to head to South Korea uh, for the Winter Olympics. And so our thoughts and our prayers are with her as she goes and uh, with their family as, as they, um, as her parents especially, are nervous wrecks. Uh, biting all their fingernails off and getting really nervous about it. I'm sure you are, but we're going to pray for her as well. Let's, uh, before we uh, get into the Word of God, let's, um, let's pray for our time. Lord, we do thank you and we praise you for um, this time together, for uh, this opportunity to open your Word, um, to be changed and transformed by it. And we pray that's what would happen. Uh, you know what we bring in. You know the stuff that we bring in that hinders us from really getting to know you better and really... Um, honoring you with our lives, and Lord, we pray that this uh, 
this time would change us and transform us and, and that your word would, would do its work in our hearts and our minds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, for 11 years, some of you may not know this, but for 11 years I was a worship leader in my former church, uh, First Pres Haines City, and I did basically what HL did. I got up every Sunday morning with a guitar and sang, not as well as HL does, mind you, um, and I led worship. I led the singing part of the worship service. And, and one of the things that's frustrating for worship leaders in contemporary services all across the country, and HL and I have talked about this before, is no matter how many people are kind of singing and engaged, there's always a group of people or, or a large group of people, maybe it's even just one person, who is like standing there, arms crossed, look at you like, I dare you to make me sing. And, and, and in our culture, in our kind of time, that, that grows more and more in worship services. People just, they kind of have a hard time singing in church. And that's not just a contemporary worship thing, that's a traditional worship thing. And, and I remember one time I voiced this frustration in a seminary class. And we were just kind of talking, and I voiced this frustration. One of the other students said, you know, we are just not a singing, kind of dancing culture anymore. People are not really comfortable with music as much as they used to be. And I thought about that for a long time. You know, not a singing, dancing culture. We're not a culture that's really comfortable with music and engaging music. And then um, a few months later, I got for my birthday tickets to go see one of my absolute favorite bands, Jimmy Eat World. Okay. Now, if you are my age, you know who Jimmy Eat World is. And if you're of a particular set of people, you know who Jimmy... Come on now. Nobody? Seriously? They were huge. They're awesome. All right. Okay, I got like five people that are really engaged with me now. Okay, I'm talking to you. Everybody else just tune out. Okay, so I was at this show. It was at the House of Blues, and it was packed with people, I guess a lot like me. And um, people were going insane. Now, the band is loud, okay? If you've been to a rock concert, bands are loud. But I could not hear the lead singer singing because the entire audience was singing the lyrics, and they were dancing around, okay? People that have no business dancing were dancing to this. And then, then a couple of months later, uh, I went to a Tampa Bay Rays game. And you know what I noticed in the seventh inning? Everybody got up in the middle of the seventh inning and started singing a song. What was it? Take me out to the ball game. And you know all the lyrics. And guess what? People that have no business dancing, they'll do hand motions to take me out to the ball game. One, two, Three strikes, you're out at the old ball game, right? So uh, that's why I don't do this anymore, okay? And, and so it's amazing. I just, I, after this conversation in the seminary class, being a worship leader, what I found to be true was that it's a lie that we are uncomfortable with music and uncomfortable with singing and uncomfortable with dancing. Even people that should not dance are not uncomfortable dancing in the right circumstance. And last week, we started this series called Wholehearted. Kenny kicked us off by kind of laying the foundation that says, by basically saying that when we worship, whether it's individual worship, whether it's gathered worship, true worship is done in spirit and in truth. And one of the things that Kenny kind of admitted himself was that it's very easy for, for him to, to kind of latch on to the truth part. And for a lot of us, it's kind of easy to latch on to the truth part, the, the mental and intellectual recognition of the truth of God. But a little bit more difficult to, to kind of latch on to the spirit of worship, which is more like the emotional and the passionate adoration and the, that passionate response to who God is and what he has done and what he is doing. And one of the centerpieces of our gathered worship experience is the time of singing, which marries the truth about God in, in the lyrics with the spirit of worship of God, the, the, the passionate, emotive adoration of who God is and what he's done. And that's why singing is, is this, one of the centerpieces of our worship experience. And yet, while we will sing in all sorts of other venues and we will dance in other venues, the problem with our worship experience is that a lot of us don't sing. We especially don't dance in worship because, oh my gosh, I am too dignified for that. I am too dignified for that. And we let our dignity overrule our passion for who God is. And what he's done. And what he is doing. And I say dignity, but that's just a really fancy way to say pride. 
That's just a really, you know, dressed up way to say pride. We're just too proud when we come in here. You know, God's people have always been a worshiping people. That's, that's what we do. We, we gather together and we worship. In the Old Testament, the centerpiece of worship was this tent called the tabernacle. And it was this mobile worship space that the people would, would kind of, you know, kind of bind up whenever they had to move from place to place. And then they would set it was a very elaborate tent. And in the middle of this tent was a particular piece of furniture. And, and, and the piece of furniture, that, that kind of, you know, minimizes what it is. But it was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, this is one example of what it might have looked like. This is from a tabernacle model in Israel, um, in Timnah, actually. And, and it was a box, I mean, that's what it is. It's a box with, with two angels or cherubim on top of it. But the, what was in the box was very, very important because what was in the box were the actual pieces of the original Ten Commandments. Now, you may not know this. Even if you're a church person, you may have forgotten this, that there are two copies of the, orig- the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. The first copy, Moses, who's bringing the people up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, he goes up the mountain for God to give him the Ten Commandments. And God literally gives him the Ten Commandments. I mean, it says that God took his finger and wrote the Ten Commandments on these, these two tablets. And Moses, who'd been up on the mountain for 40 days, comes down the mountain, and what does he see of the people of God? That they're still worshiping, but now they're worshiping a false god. They're worshiping the golden calf. And Moses, who's just spent a lot of energy and a lot of time rescuing these people at the Lord's command, he gets angry. And he throws these stone tablets down at their feet. These these representations of the holiness of God and and the righteousness of God and, and what it takes to be in relationship with God. He throws it at their feet because they are unfaithful already. And they break into pieces. And Moses goes back up the mountain and he gets another copy of the Ten Commandments. But this time, God doesn't write it himself. Moses just takes it dictation style. But those pieces they actually took, the pieces that God actually put his fingers on, they put them in this box called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant sat in the tabernacle when they worshipped. And it traveled with them wherever that they, they went. And this was, was more than just a piece of furniture. It was more than just a symbol. It was a tangible, physical image of the presence of God right in the midst of God's people. Whenever they had this Ark of the Covenant with them, things went well. They won battles that they shouldn't have won. Their crops were abundant, even when they shouldn't be abundant. It was a sign that God was holy and strong, but he also came cared about them, and was with them. But again, God's people, they tend to fail. So they got into a battle with this group called the Philistines, and the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistines thought, hey, we've got the Ark of the Covenant. We've got the the big weapon, because they thought of it as a weapon. They thought this is going to be our good luck charm in battle, and we're going to start to dominate people because we got the Ark of the Covenant. And the Israelites, who are this tiny little group of people who have no business winning battles, if they can win with the Ark, guess what we can do, because we are fighting people. And they took the Ark of the Covenant, and if you're thinking to yourself, this sounds very familiar. This sounds like a movie that I watched. It's very much like that. The Raiders of the Lost Ark just replace Nazis with Philistines and you basically got the same kind of mentality, right? They thought if we get the Ark of the Covenant, we can win World War II in, in the movie. That's not a documentary. I hope you knew that. But, um, <laughs> but Indiana Jones, you know, thwarts it, whatever. And, and what the Philistines found out was the same thing the Nazis found out in the movie. It doesn't really work like that. The transitive property with the Ark of the Covenant doesn't work because the Philistines were not God's people. And so when they had the Ark of the Covenant, things did not go well. In fact, things went very poorly for them for a long time. And they decided, you know what? This is the bane of our existence. We're sending it back. And so King David goes out to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. This, what was thought of as the throne of God or the footstool of the throne of God, they were getting to bring it back. This tangible, physical image of the presence of Almighty God. They were bringing it back. And David and all the people were excited about it. It says that David actually took 30,000 people of Israel with him. 30,000 people representing the entire nation with him. And they are getting jacked up. And they are getting excited. And they are singing. And they are dancing. And they are rising up. Because they're bringing this Ark of the Covenant back home. 
And it says this. It says, in all, And David and all the house of Israel, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. This was a serious, serious worship service, man. And they were flipping out. They were having a party of a celebration before the Lord. And here's the cool thing. It wasn't just David that was singing. It wasn't just the leader. It wasn't just, just, just David by himself who, who, who understood. It was all the people together getting caught up, singing and dancing. You know, one of the tragedies of our faith today is that we've privatized it so much. It's me and my Jesus and how I want to worship it's me and my devotion and me and my quiet time. And when I come into the gathered worship experience on Sunday morning, you can do what you want to do, but don't make me raise my hands. Don't make me sing. Because that, that ain't me, man. I, I just, I'm not a singer. I'm not a singer. That's not, that's, that's not me and my worship. We are a, a people that like our preferences. You know, in 2012, um, Bruce Springsteen, the great American singer, songwriter, rock and roll man, he was asked to give the keynote address at South by Southwest. Now, I'm assuming since none of you knew who Jimmy Eat World was that you don't know what South by Southwest is either. So here it is. South by Southwest is a gigantic music festival. It may be the most important music festival in the country, maybe in the world. Um, each spring, uh, thousands, and I'm talking thousands of bands, descend upon Austin, Texas. And tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people go to Austin, Texas to see these bands. And some of the bands you know, uh, they're very popular bands. And some of the bands, they're just trying to make it. They're just trying to break through. Well, Bruce Springsteen, I'm assuming everybody knows who Bruce Springsteen is. Give me a head nod, right? Born in the USA. Born to run. Thank you. Got, okay, everybody tracking with me? Google it. It's worth it, okay? Okay. Um, Bruce Springsteen was asked to give the keynote address for the 2012 South by Southwest. And in his keynote address, he highlighted the, the, the number of genres represented at that year's music festival. He said, there's two-tone, acid rock, alternative dance, alternative metal, alternative rock, rock art punk, art rock, avant-garde metal, black metal, black and death metal, Christian metal, heavy metal, funk metal, bland metal, medieval metal, indie metal, melodic death metal, melodic black metal, metalcore, hardcore, electronic hardcore, folk punk, folk rock, pop punk, Brit pop, grunge, sadcore, surf music, psychedelic rock, punk rock, hip hop, rap rock, rap metal, Nintendo core, Rock noir, shock rock, skate punk, noise core, noise pop, noise rock, pagan rock, paisley underground, indie pop, indie rock, heartland rock, roots rock, samba rock, screamo, emo, shoegazing, stu stoner rock, swamp pop, synth pop, rock against communism, garage rock, blues rock, death and roll, lo-fi, jangle pop, folk music, just add neo and post to everything I just said and do it all again. And yeah, there's rock and roll in one festival all those genres. You look at Spotify playlists or Apple Music playlists or, or YouTube playlists, and you're just going to see the number of genres, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of different genres. And that's not even the songs. We are a people who like our preferences, which means that we're not really a people at all. We're individuals. And look, there's nothing wrong with preferences, okay? But when we take that mentality and we bring it in here, it becomes very unhealthy. It becomes entertainment. I didn't like that song. That's not my jam. I like that song. I don't like that song. They don't play the songs I like. I like it when it's up-tempo. I like it when it's down-tempo. I like it when it's no-tempo. I like it when, when Nikki claps her hands. I don't like it when Nikki claps her hands. I like it when Michelle raises her hands. I don't like it when Michelle raises her hands. I like it when, when HL plays the electric. I don't like it when HL plays the acoustic. You know, that's what we do. It's unhealthy. And what we lose when we take that mentality into this place is we lose, here it is, the positive peer pressure of God's people to sing to the Lord. We are very good at succumbing to peer pressure in the right circumstances. You all know that I am an Alabama a Crimson Tide football fan. I know Sweet Home Alabama like the back of my hand. I know all the little things that they do in Bryant-Denny Stadium to Sweet Home Alabama. I know the third down chance. I know the kickoff drone. I know all of that stuff. But 
Before I could afford to go to games myself and go to Tuscaloosa, um, I was, you know, subject to my father-in-law, uh, his preferences, and he was a Florida State fan. And so he would take us to Florida State games. Now, I had nothing against Florida State. I got nothing against Florida. They're just not my preferred team. But I'll tell you something. By the middle of the first quarter, do you know what I was doing? F-L-O-R-I-D-A-S-T-A-T-E. Florida State, Florida State, Florida State. See, we get excited about what we want to get excited about, don't we? <laughs> now, was it my preferred team? And I'm sure some of you are now totally lost you because you're Gator fans, and you're like, that is such sacrilege. Um, <clears throat> but, you, but you understand, it's not my preferred team, but I was in it because there's tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people following the liturgy, the religion of sport, and willingly getting jacked up, excited, crazy, doing stuff like painting their chests. We're talking like accountants, people, painting their chests, <laughs> being nuts. But we come in here, we're, we're, we're confronted with the almighty God who spoke creation into existence. We're, we're confronted with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who gave his life down so that we would not have to bear the brunt of our sin, the punishment of our sin. And we go, nope, I'm not a singing person. I don't get crazy like that. Look at that crazy person over there. They're raising their hands. That's what we do. We lose the positive peer pressure of the people of God when we come in here just married to our preferences. And here's the, the thing is when the people of God get, to get together and worship, they're committed to it, it does get a little crazy. It says, it says that the people, it says that the people were celebrating celebrating before the Lord with songs. Now that word in the Hebrew, it, it actually means that they were laughing out loud. They were laughing out loud, joyously engaging in the celebration of God with joy. They were playing with abandonment that a lot of people would call foolish. You know, the Apostle Paul picks up on the same idea of worship being a part, of singing being a part of our gathered worship experience in Colossians chapter 3. He says this, he says, Above all these things put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. And a lot of us want to stop and say, yep, that's Presbyterian right there, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. But Paul says that's not it. How do we do that? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to one another, with one another, celebrating with one another. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, when we get together and we all gather together and we all commit to say, hey, I'm going to celebrate, it can get a little nuts. It can get a little crazy. It can get a little foolish. And David takes this and he just magnifies this later on in the chapter. Now, if you read the rest of chapter uh, 6, you're going to see as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, they're reminded full well how holy God is. Because Uzzah, who's one of the guys carrying the Ark, decides he's going to have to put his hand on the Ark of the Covenant to uh, kind of steady it. Well, guess what? That doesn't go so well. If you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know that doesn't go so well. And Uzzah dies. And, and everybody kind of has this moment like, well, wait a minute. This is real. This is like a real thing. This is a real presence of the holy God. And God has some real rules for us. And uh, so we're just going to leave this over here at this guy's house named Obed-Edom because we're a little scared. The 30,000 people say, okay, David, we're just going to take a pause break. Okay, so they take a little hiatus. And after a while, they realize that Obed-Edom is being blessed because he's got the Ark of the Covenant. He's one of God's people. And David says, hey, let's go back and let's get it. Let's bring it all the way to Jerusalem. And so he rallies the, the people and they go back to Obed-Edom's house and they begin to bring it back to Jerusalem. And the worship service goes from just kind of sort of crazy to really all out insane. This is what it says in verse 12. And so, so David went and brought up the Ark of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom. To the city of David. That's Jerusalem. With rejoicing. Now here, here's how crazy it gets. When the ark 
those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he stopped everything. Now, we're not talking like extremely distant from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem, but it ain't close either. It's a few miles. Every six steps, we're talking about a first down's worth, okay? Every six steps, he stops everything and says, we're going to sacrifice an animal because God is so holy. And he proved to us how holy he was with Uzzah's mistake. So we're not going to make that mistake. We're going we're to sacrifice to God. We're still going to rejoice. We're still going to sing. We're going to stop everything. We're going to sacrifice to God. And then it says, David danced before the Lord with all his might. Everything he had, all of his strength, he put towards dancing before the Lord. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of the Lord brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. David was so overjoyed, so overwhelmed by his desire to, to demonstrate his passionate worship for God in the presence of the ark coming back to his city, to Jerusalem. He danced before God and he, he danced like a servant, okay? Because he danced down in his linen ephod. Now, we don't know what a linen ephod is, but yes, we do. It's your underwear, so it's the upper underwear and the lower underwear, okay? And that was the, the garments of the servants. That was the garments of the slaves. And David was putting himself on their level. He was saying, I am just a worshiper right now. I am just a worshiper of Almighty God in the eyes of God. I'm no better than the, the, the slaves and these servants. The problem is, David's still the king. Now, kings don't typically strip down to their underwear and dance in front of their entire kingdoms. Um, Julie and I have been watching uh, a lot of kind of British documentaries on the House of Windsor, so the British royal family. That's because we started watching The Crown on Netflix, which is great. And, and one of the things that they highlight about Elizabeth II is that she doesn't show any emotion. Like, that's one of her, the strengths of her position is that she doesn't have any high highs or low lows. She's just even, dignified. That's not what David's doing here. David's getting nuts. And he's getting nuts in front of everybody, and everybody's joining in. But there's one person who has a problem with it, and that is his wife. His wife, Michal or Michael. She is not only his wife, but she is the daughter of another king, the, the daughter of Saul. And when David comes home to bless his home, to bless his home for the, for the fact that the Ark of the Covenant is, is coming back to his city, she has some words for him. It says, the Ark of the Lord came into the city of David, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She was embarrassed. Now, guys, be honest. Your wives ever been embarrassed by you? Sure they have. They may, they'd be nice enough not to tell you that, but they have. Um, and David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel has honored himself today. Dripping with sarcasm. Uncovering himself. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants. As one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. This is quintessential, what will the neighbors think, argumentation. What will people think if they see you like that? How does that portray you as, as a king? How could you be so foolish? How could you debase yourself like that? How could you be so undignified? You know, when we get down to it, if we have a problem singing and dancing and being passionate and being demonstrative, in a worship service, doesn't it come down to what will the people think that are sitting next to me? Doesn't it really come down to what will the people think who are sitting in front of me who have, have to listen to my, my, my voice coming out? Isn't, isn't that really what it comes down to when we'd rather do this than, than show any kind of expression and any kind of emotion, any kind of passion in our singing for God? And, and look, I'm not... I know some of you are going to want to run back and talk to Pastor Mike and say, Zach is, is advocating Pentecostalism. He's trying to make us charismatic. I am not doing that at all. But what I am asking us to do is to examine our hearts about our engagement or our lack of engagement when we sing in worship. Because it's not just a show. You are not here to be entertained by HL and the band. That's not what you're here for. They're great, but that's not what you're here for. That's not what I'm here for. I'm asking that we examine 
our hearts and examine why we are willing to get so crazy for any sports team or any hobby or any pop concert or any Hollywood award show or why we're willing to get crazy for our kids' accomplishments, but we're not willing to get a little bit, just a little bit crazy for Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world who died for you. You know how dark your sin is. He doesn't care. He died for it. Why can't we get a little crazy? I'm not asking for, I'm just saying a little bit. Once in a while, close your eyes and sing. Examine our hearts. Why, why can't we get there? David's response to, to his wife is, is so classic, and, and it really deserves our attention. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me a, a, as prince over Israel the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord, and I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants that you've spoken of, by them I shall be held in honor. Now this is a a bold statement. And and I can imagine that Michael Michael wanted to put David on the couch after this statement, but but there's something really significant about what he says. It's first of all, he doesn't give two shakes about the people around him. He is only concerned about the audience of the Lord. It was before the Lord. It wasn't before the female servants. It wasn't before all the nation of Israel. It wasn't before any of them. I could care less, David says. All I cared about was that I was celebrating before God. All I cared about was that I was celebrating before the Lord. His celebration, his singing, his dancing, it wasn't a show. And I know that that, that some of the response that some people have about the people that are really demonstrative and raising their hands and singing, they must be trying to show off how spiritual they are. David is is putting it out there. Look, it's not a show. It's about me celebrating what God has done for all the people of Israel. For all the people of Israel. And I'm going to celebrate before him. It wasn't a show. It was to demonstrate that his own dignity, his own station was nothing compared to the honor that he wanted to give the Lord. And so he's willing to sacrifice any dignity, any pride that he might have for the sake of God. And ultimately, that sacrifice of dignity before the audience of one really will ultimately lead to more honor for him. He says, look, the the, the slave girls that you're worried about, I'm going to be held in honor before them. I might be an embarrassment to you, Michael. I might be an embarrassment to you and all that you stand for, but I'm going to be held in honor by the people who really get it, who really understand. This lines up perfectly with the words of Jesus in Matthew 23. Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And so it begs the question for us, what do we value more? Do we value the worship of Almighty God or do we value our own pride? Do we value openly celebrating who God is and what he's done for us because he's done so much and he is so wonderful? Or do we value our own honor more than his? And if we get to this place where we realize, you know what, I come in here and I do, I really do worry about what other people think. If we can come to that realization and say, I want to get past that. Okay, how do I overcome that? I think there's really just two things I want to highlight. First is commit to increasing your engagement. Commit to increasing our engagement. And that means that, that we commit to being here Sunday after Sunday. We commit to this time of worshiping and singing and praying and gathering around God's word together because there is positive peer pressure when we're together and we're committed to being engaged together. The more we practice engagement, the more engaged we will actually be. It goes a long way to helping us immerse in the story of Jesus, in the, in the grace of Jesus, in, in, in the good news of his gospel for all of us. And we can increase our engagement Monday through Saturday as well. Look, the, the music that we do here on Sunday, it's not coming from nowhere. It's all over. And you can go and search for it, you can go look for it, but we're going to try to help you out just a little bit. Right today, after the service is over, you go on Facebook and you're going to see a playlist of the songs that we did today to try to help you increase your engagement. 
And God willing, between HL and I, and I'm just putting HL on the spot here because he doesn't know I was going to do this, um, we're going to try to keep that updated week over week so that each week before you come in on Sunday morning, you can have an opportunity to, to get into the words and get into the music and say, I want to be engaged. And it's not just, it's not for show. It's so that you can celebrate without conscious, conscience of, of what other people are doing, but just, but just being together with God's people and engaging in that and being willing to celebrate that together. So on Facebook, on our Facebook page, we've got a YouTube playlist that's going to go up right as soon as this service is over. And you can start engaging Monday through Saturday before coming in on Sunday and making that commitment. The other thing we can do is measure our enthusiasm. Now, that word enthusiasm, it actually comes from the Greek word uh, that means possessed by God, means literally possessed by God, or possessed by a God. Now, the only time you can really be truly enthusiastic is when you're here. If you're enthusiastic outside of here, you're being possessed by another God. When you come here, and you you engage in the worship, and you're you're singing, and you're celebrating, you're you're being possessed by our God, the, the one true God. But, but the question is, do we approach these times of worship possessed by, by the one true God or possessed by something else, possessed by another God? And maybe we can overcome the, the enthusiasm of all the other kind of competing factors in our world by, by just showing up a little earlier on Sunday morning and just kind of centering ourselves and praying through it. I'm not talking about an hour early. I'm not talking about 30 minutes early, just a few minutes early, just to say I'm going to center myself a little bit more on, on, what, on meeting God today in this space with God's people. Maybe getting up a little bit earlier on Sunday morning and just praying through the, 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 the obstacles to, 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 to worship. Because I know we come in here and we got distractions. We have those distractions. And God can overwhelm those distractions if we'll commit ourselves to him. The truth is, we should be more enthusiastic in this space than any other space on the planet. Any other space on the planet, it should pale in comparison to the worship of the gathered church in, 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 in his name. It should pale in comparison. You know, the Bible makes it clear that we are a singing, dancing people, whether you know it or not. And we're a part of a singing creation, a creation that literally sings for the sake of God. And the Bible reminds us in the book of Revelation that in heaven, the primary activity of our worship will be singing to God. Heck, the middle of the Bible is one big songbook. We are called to sing with abandon, with enthusiasm, with engagement to the God who loves us and cares for us and sent his son to die for us. The question is, will we raise our voices with excitement, with engagement, with enthusiasm and answer that call? Let's pray. Gracious God, you know our hearts. You know our hearts. You know where we're, we're sold out, bought in, and we're, we're, we're focused on you. And you know where we are distracted by our own pride. You know where we're distracted by our own shortcomings. And Lord, I pray that you would strip it all back. Even right now, as we get ready to sing, we sing hallelujah to you. That you are great and you are wonderful and that you would fill our hearts that you would overwhelm our sense of decorum and our sense of pride and our sense of dignity for your sake and your sake alone. We pray this in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
know some of you might not be comfortable with the clapping. I don't care. I really don't. Because we're not clapping for these guys. We're not. We're clapping for him. And that song perfectly encapsulates why. Because our God is a great and powerful God sit on, sitting on a throne. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he rescued you. He rescued you from the darkness of your sin and your shame. That's how much he loves you. And that is worth singing about. Every single day, and especially when we gather together, know this, in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys next Sunday.